progress. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath hours that will be coming soon for, for us. And maybe and I know other places it's already Sabbath. We just ask, Lord, for uh, your Holy Spirit to be in our midst, to teach us, to guide us and direct us in our studies, and to correct us when we are in error. We pray, Lord, that um, you can be with each person searching for truth. We know that we do not understand everything fully, uh, but we know that you are leading in our lives, and so we ask that you can continue to work upon our hearts, that you can bring the conviction and power that comes with truth. Be with us now in this study, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. It's And happy Sabbath. If it's Sabbath there already, it's going to be Sabbath in about... Uh, um, half an hour or so here I think and um, we're begin we're continuing this study on the presidents of the United States but you can see here on my screen is the study that Odilio gave on Sabbath and I need to comment on some of the things in here so it was, it's a very powerful study uh, one of the things that he's he was looking at so I'm going to kind of sum it up how I understand it is that we have two appearances that occur and uh, these are going to be eight days apart and these occurrences one of them is going to be with doubting Thomas who's not there initially and this has to do with their disappointment and of course we have experienced a dis disappointment just like the disciples did just like the Millerites did not that we wanted Nashville to be hit by a nuclear attack on July 18th but, um, and I wouldn't say that I had high hopes. He says, similarly, we had high hopes that with the fulfillment of July 18th prophecy, we would, in our case, free spiritual Israel, the Levites, from the Roman yoke. So I actually personally uh, didn't believe that this movement was ready for what was going to happen if Nashville was going to occur. Plus, it was also in a line of failed predictions. So... And we also knew that our line was typical. That is, we weren't really, we really should not have expected that we could predict events on our line, that the external events related to our line were, were tied to our line to show an internal work. So, but you can say our expectation was not met. Now, some people then abandoned July 18th because we obviously had made a false prediction, so we were false prophets. Of course, we know the Millerites did the same thing. And the, one of the arguments was, well, the day after, uh, Hiram Edson had the vision of Christ going into the most holy place. So they had, they had evidence right the next day that even though they never saw anything personally, Hiram Edson did. But of course... Adventists generally didn't know about this until 19, into the early 1900s. Um, so the, the Hiram, Epps, Epps, Hiram Edson's cornfield vision is known to us now, but it wasn't known to the Millerites or even accepted uh, by Adventists generally since they didn't know about it until m many, many years later. And... Um, from that vision, he was friends with uh, um, Crozier. They, him and another brother did some studies, and then they came out in, in February of, what is it, February 7th of 1846 that the Daystar comes out. Uh, but still no mention of his, his vision in the cornfield, even though it was the impetus for that study. Now... I would say that when we look at our movement now, uh, we can see that God has been giving us continual light, and he did give us light even prior to July 18th, that helped us understand our disappointment. Now, Adilio is trying to, in, in my view, 
in his studies that he's done, the studies that he's done with uh, the mandates and the studies here of the appearances, that he's sort of arguing that we were correct, but differently than I'm arguing that we were correct. That is, I believe we were correct as to uh, the time, but not to the event. He seems to be more arguing that the event was fulfilled. Would people agree with me on that um, observation? I can't see how the event would be would be the event. Because he's going to tie the event to the pandemic. That he says what we really were predicting was the pandemic. Oh, uh, it seems kind of seems kind of off balance to me. Yeah, well, yeah, so we know we predicted the pandemic, and we predicted the pandemic um, in connection with, with a line that we have. Um, so that was uh, January 14th, 2017. It was at Glen Park Hall, which I was just there on Sunday for the first time since then. Um, and um, so he made this prediction regarding the pandemic and that it would happen between the symbols of midnight and the midnight cry, which we later marked as November 9th and July 18th. So the pandemic did occur in connection with those periods of time. So, so we can say that we predicted the pandemic, but we can't say that July 18th was really about the pandemic. It's connected to a whole series of prophecies. Now, maybe I'm misrepresenting how um, Odilia looks at this, but it seems to me that he's trying to argue we were correct, right, in, in, in some way. Um, so he's going to say here, to continue this application, we read in John 20 that Christ, after his resurrection, appeared twice to the disciples in the upper room to show them evidence that he was alive and well. Likewise, concerning July 18th, evidence has been shown twice in two separate studies that this prophecy was alive and well. Now, he's pointing to his personal studies um, regarding this. And, and I would say that we've had way more um, evidences about July 18th. But he's trying to argue for a different type of evidence that July 18th is alive and well. That is, it's, it's alive and well in a different way than we take it. Now, he's going to refer here to his studies um, on Nero, right? So there's the study on Nero and the study dealing with the mandates. So this Nero study that he did, um, he actually uh, did these studies on my YouTube page. So he did the studies with me. And um, and that was basically, because we, we went through this again, but the studies on Nero had to do with July 18th that Nero burned the city of Rome on July 18th. And so the burning of Rome um, and the COVID crisis, these two different um, experiences, um, he's going to now parallel with the upper room experience. So that's basically his argument. He's going to show some evidences of this. But I would argue that we've had way more light than just these two studies. But he's focusing on his two personal studies, which I have no problem with. Um, it's just that we have other things that we have looked to as well. And, and they just have, have just as much evidences or even more evidences that this is directed by God than we even see in his studies. He has some of these evidences, the same symbols are being used, the same types of uh, studies are being used, but they're, they're coming from different directions, from different people, from Stephen, from me, um, uh, from uh, Dan Vanderhorst, things that Iran has found, uh, things brother from Vietnam had found, things that Dwight had found, 
So God is giving us all of this light, and so it's it's not just coming from Odilia, but he's marking here from, from his personal perspective his two studies. Um, then we're going to have this uh, in John 20, uh, after eight days. So after eight days, his disciples were within, and Thomas with, was, was with them. So he's going to deal with these eight days. Now, I don't want to go through all of his studies, but one of the things about the mandates is we had November 9th, but according to Wikipedia, uh, the patient zero is November 17th, 2019. And that's a period of eight days. Now, technically speaking, when it says after eight days, it's actually seven days later. So it's an inclusive count. Um, nonetheless, the symbol is still there. And um, so in the Nero study, he had this 777 structure going from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021. And then the COVID study, um, so he's going to line these up with this, with the 780 uh, day structure that starts November 17th, 2019. So, so he's going to use these, these eight days and tie this together. And then he's going to, um, well, he says here there's these two studies. So he does one June 13th, 2021. And um, so that's going to be um, the study that he did with me, so on my YouTube page. And then uh, the COVID crisis study that he did with the Canadian group on February 12th, 2022. So he's going to take these dates, 16, 13, and 2, 12, and multiply them together, and you're going to get 1872. So 1872 is one tenth of 18720, which is the main symbol that we've had for July 18, 2020. So, so we can definitely see that there's a connection. So we're not going to say that there's this connection. We're going to say that this is in God's providence, that there's there's a purpose for it, that um, uh, that God has directed these numbers and these dates, and that He's also helped Odilio find these things. But we would argue that simply because we find something, it doesn't mean that our understanding is complete. So we found lots of things, and we would argue that our understanding is still incomplete. We still haven't put it all together. Now, what I believe that we have to do is I believe that the Nero study is valid and the COVID crisis, crisis and July 18 study is valid, except in some of the conclusions, and particularly the elements that have to do with unprovable uh, theories or speculations. By unprovable, I mean something that cannot be proved by very definition of it. That is, there's no way that we could prove uh, some of these what we call conspiracy theories because the nature of these theories is such that if we found evidence to disprove them, because they're a conspiracy, uh, that evidence would have to be discounted. So they can't be proven or disproven. More specifically, they can't be disproven. That is, nobody could argue against them. And so you're in this situation where somebody presents something uh, as true, but anything you say that shows that it's not true would just simply be part of the conspiracy. So... So that's what I mean by an unprovable theory. So Adilio has placed these things uh, in the Nero study, dealing with 9-11, and also in the COVID crisis, certain elements of his study um, shows that he, he tries to argue that these are, in a sense, planned. So, and I would argue that we can't prove or disprove these things and that they then have no place in our understanding of truth. That is, things need to be based upon something that's that's true by definition. That is, 
It has to be objective. Now, we could argue that we have these symbols or these numbers. And I don't argue against the numbers or the symbols. I think that these are correct, that they're put there by God. The problem is in how we interpret them and what we think they mean. So, so he presents these two studies that he did. And he's going to show then that there is this connection between these studies. And he's later going to argue for a close of probation, as you will see. Now, so Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. And then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins, whos, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, in his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. And Jesus saith, saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So he's going to go through this. Um, so Thomas is one of the twelve, Didymus, which means a twin, right? So we're going to find that out. Um, and we're going to look at his name. Uh, um, so, what's it, Didymus, uh, twofold. And the name Thomas means a twin. So both of them, so it's a twin doubled. So, um, so both his names are, are referring to either a twin or doubling. Okay. Uh, so, so it's kind of interesting. We have this doubling that's happening with Thomas, which is a symbol of the midnight cry. Um, and then we're going to see these doubling of these passages, 2019 and 2026. So the doors were shut, disciples were assembled. Jesus came, Jesus stood in the midst. You're going to see these same, same words uh, put together. And then he's going to deal with this, um, the gathering. So the Greek word here for assembled means to gather together those who were previously separated or to be caught in a net like fishes. This most certainly connects with the experience of the priests who were scattered after the disappointment of July 18, 2020. But now the purpose of this message is to gather them like fish in a net and like sheep back into the fold to do a special work for the Lord. And of course, we would agree with this interpretation that this is correct. This is what we believe is happening. Um, then came Jesus. The appearance of Jesus before the disciples was in type his second coming. Um, the resurrection of Jesus was a type of the final resurrection of all who sleep in him. That's from Desire of Ages, page 804. Now, uh, it doesn't say that Jesus coming to his disciples is a type of his second coming. Ellen White says that the resurrection of Jesus was a type of the final resurrection. But you know, it's it's probably not untrue that there's this resurrection and Christ comes and stands in the midst. So there is a connection. 
In type, the resurrection of Jesus parallels the final resurrection, which is the, at the second coming. In type, July 18, 2020, was to be the second coming for the priests. Um, how do we how do we put July 18, 2020 as a second coming for the priests? Where did that idea that July 18, 2020 is the second coming for the priests? Anybody know? Why, why would we say that? Why is he saying this? What, what is the argument he's using to say that July 18 was supposed to be the second coming for the priests? Based on what? No, it was Snow's last letter. Okay, it's Snow's last letter, but it has to do with the way that we looked at the lines. Uh, October, two, uh, October 13th, 2018, was the midnight cry for the priests. That's how we looked at that, that symbol. So that's me counting 391 and a half days to November 9th. So the midnight cry, November 9th then becomes the close of probation, and then July 18th becomes the second coming, right, for the priests. So that would be in the line of the priests. Now, were we correct about that line? That is, it was the line of the priest. Was it truly the line of the priests? It is a reform line, and those way marks are sound, but was it really the line of the priests? Didn't it have more to do with uh, the Omega? Oh, okay, so sort of it's a mixture of the omega and basically parminder's understanding of the lines mixed with our us following the logical conclusions right now omega didn't accept october 13th as the midnight cry but they did accept november 9th as a close of probation so they looked to october 3rd when tess presented november 9th uh, they ignored that she presented on that day uh, two presentations, one called the Midnight Cry and the other one called Ten Years, and that it was confirmed ten days later on October 13th by the counting of the 391 and a half days to November 9th. The Omega never accepted that argument. Cass rejected it. So since she rejected it, the whole Omega movement rejected it. But we followed logically from the lines that Parminder had set up, that we then must be looking at November 9th as something to do with the line of the priests. But after the passing of the time, we came to recognize it was a reform line, but it wasn't the reform line we thought of. Now, Adilio, in a sense, is arguing that it was. That is, Adilio is making an argument that Parminder's understanding of the lines and our then use of his understanding was correct. Now, if we were gonna look at Millerite history, how, are, how would we parallel with Odilio's interpretation of July 18th and other interpretations of October 22nd, 1844? Can we find any parallel between what he's doing and what others were doing with October 22nd? Specifically, people like Samuel Snow, after the passing of the time. There's others, too, other interpretations. So what did people do who accepted, accepted October 22nd, 1844, 
but did not become part of the Seventh-day Adventists. Some of them did, but some of them didn't. What were they teaching? What kind of things were being well, taught? Well, they're continuing setting dates. Okay, so you had some people setting dates. Yeah. But you also had some people interpreting October 22nd, 1844, as being fulfilled, that Christ had come secretly to the earth. Very similar to what happened with Jehovah's Witnesses later on with, I um, can't remember the year, it was 18, was it 1876? And then later on that he had come secretly. I can't remember the year, that's probably wrong. And then later on, 1914, that he had come secretly. So, that, so there was this kind of argument that Christ had come secretly. Um, so Odelio could be right. So maybe I'm completely wrong in my understanding of these things. Maybe Odelio's right, but we would have to examine it and see if this is sound. But his is based upon that we weren't wrong, that July 18th was to be the second coming of the priests. And now he says in type, we know that July 18th typified the second coming in the application of those lines. But did anything happen on July 18th in, in type? That is, did some event occur on July 18th that we could then say is the second coming? No. Okay. No. So we're arguing that no event occurred, but that something internally occurred. Right? That's our argument. At least that's my argument. I would say so. Yeah. That this was about, in, about this movement's preparation to give a message. And Odilio is, is also saying that, but he's looking at it slightly differently than we have in our morning, morning studies. Now, um, and he stood in the midst. So he's going to look at all of these different events here. Now, Christ standing in the midst of the disciples, he says Daniel 12, 1. So he's going to compare that to Christ standing um, at the right hand of God, Michael standing up as a type of close of probation. So he's arguing that um, if the disciples typify the priests, this is suggesting we are now in a phase where Jesus is about to pronounce judgment upon the priests. It's very probable that this judgment is connected to the understanding and acceptance of the truths that have been presented in this movement, in particular those truths associated with the July 18 prophecy. So he's arguing that a type of close of probation is going to occur in connection with this, right? So that's that's his argument that he's using in the midst. And of course, he's going to use the door being shut. So we know that the shut door is a close of probation. And, and we can argue that all of these things are correct. But the application, the understanding of these symbols is correct. I would just say that the application or where he's placing this is where I would find fault, and you'll see why. Okay, so the door is being shut. This typifies the close of probation. So we don't really need to look into this too much. Um, but he's connecting this to the Trump prediction. So he says, if this prophecy is valid, we want to be sure to be on the right side of the door before it closes, before Trump becomes president. Now, why is how is he connecting this to the Trump prediction? He just says the Trump prediction may very well be the cleaver to suit that purpose. Is there any reason that you would jump to the Trump prediction as the truth that's going to decide who's on the right side of the door before it closes? I can't see any link. link. Right. So I, I don't see the link here at all. I mean, in, in his study... There's nothing. It's just an if. It may very well be, right? So now, Adilio, of course, I'm not saying that, you know, that in him being wrong, that somehow he's rejected light or anything. But he is presenting this as a possibility. 
I don't think he's saying this is 100% certain. He has these ifs in here. He has this modifying language. He's just saying, if this is true, maybe this is what's happening. Now, it is true, by rejecting or ignoring valuable truths that have been leading up to this message, we close our door and we will be shut out from further light, causing us to gradually slide into darkness. Now, the light that God has been giving this movement before July 18th and after, um, I would say primarily it comes from all of the studies that we have been doing. So we have had... If we want to look at two groups, we have um, the American group and the Canadian group that have been studying. Um, they've been doing, Daniel Fontenot has been doing some studies on his website, Jewels of Truth. And then we have uh, Colin studies on Saturday night. And then, of course, the Sabbath studies. But if we look at those studies, um, those studies are fairly basic. And there's nothing wrong with basic studies. But have we seen a great deal of light coming from those studies or anything that really would claim to be great light until Colin's study? Um, not really. A lot of informative information. Um, yeah. Kind of so, putting a yeah. different uh, angle on it. That's about it. Yeah. So so we've seen Odilio come and do some presentations here and Colin as well. And I argue that they're, they're generally correct, that there is things in their studies that we can't ignore, that God is giving us light. I believe that God is giving us light because we have to make a choice. And that light's coming from lots of different places. God is leading this movement. But the, the point is, can we argue that it's that simple, that we just need to accept this, this conclusion here of Odilio's or the conclusion of Collins or any of the conclusions that I've come to, that we can just side with the truth? What is it that we're going to have to do if we're going to be on the right side of the door before it closes? What has God told us we have to do? What did the Millerites do in 1850, 1849, 1850, all through that history leading up to the making of the 1850 chart and even afterwards? What did they do? They went back and they studied to determine the points that they needed to clarify as to where they may have gone wrong. Okay, and when they differed on points, what did they do? They separated, they prayed, they came together and they considered the alternate viewpoints of everybody else. Right. Now, that is what we are doing here on Friday nights. That's not what's happening, and I'm just being as direct as I can. That's not what's happening on Sabbath. So on Sabbath with the Canadian and the American group, they basically have shut some people out of the discussion, uh, first by kind of shouting them down, uh, misrepresentation, gossip, rumors, etc., and then basically by just not allowing them to be participants in the discussion. And this would not be according to the counsel that God has given. And I don't think Odilio would be on the side of that idea. He's, he's himself has experienced that being shut out, not being heard back in um, uh, August 29th, uh, 2019. So, so he knows what that's like. So I don't imagine Odilio would be on you know, happy about that type of thing. Let's be even more direct than that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the situation is those that chose to separate from the Millerites in 1840, 1842, and 1844 basically yeah. went to have nothing further to do with those that continued to study. Right. 
So we have, now, in, in all of these situations, we're being shown what has happened as an example of what will happen. Yeah. And, and we, we looked at this really carefully when we studied early writings, page 74. And God has kept continued to give us illustrations of this all through our studies. That is, we cannot just simply dismiss something based upon how we feel about a person or whether it, it agrees with what we understand. We have to study these things uh, diligently, right? We have to look at them. And, and the call is to do this together. Right? Amen. Yeah. Right. So, so this movement has to study all of this information. If we, if we were, if I was to say, well, Colin's wrong, don't study his material. Odilio's wrong, don't study his material. I would be wrong in doing that. One is because I believe God's giving us light. And, and all of this light is going to come together. But this also gives us this individual responsibility of having to study this light out for ourselves. That is, we can't just depend upon following someone. Okay? So, uh, Where sorry, in the Bible does it say that we are to follow any other man? <laughs> I'm not of Paul, of uh, Paulus. Right? your arm. <laughs> yeah. So, no. The Bereans went and studied, so we have to study. You know, that's what we've been urging people to do. That's what Jeff urged people to do. You study these things out for yourself. And there is an importance of the group studying together. Because I could say, well, I'm going to study these things out on my own. And, and I'm not going to... Uh, you know, because you run into this all the time. Well, I need to study the Bible for myself, so I'm not going to read any of your studies. Uh, and yet those persons are going to put studies out there that they expect me to read. <laughs> they bring you know, different ideas. Right. They bring different ideas to the table. Yeah. Yeah, so we need to be corrected. God uses other people to correct us. So if I need to be corrected then people need to spend time studying with me to correct me. Because I am easily corrected. If somebody can present arguments that are going to show that I'm wrong, I'll be happy to change my understanding of something. But often what I see is that, you know, as we study these things, all these things that I've studied all the things that Odilio has studied, all the things Colin has studied, that, that Dwight has studied, Stephen has studied, all these things come together and, and they give us a more clear picture than if I just studied on my own. If I studied on my own, I would hardly learn anything. I mean, I'd learn some things, but not everything that God wants to show us. So he says here, by rejecting or, or ignoring valuable truths that has, has been leading up to this message, we close our door and we will be shut out from further light. So we can't reject or ignore valuable truths. Even if we, we do so because we don't like somebody or somebody maybe has a bad attitude or argues, you know, so we're just not going to listen to that person. We're going to cut them out. That's not really a valid reason to not hear someone. Um, now, this connection to Revelation 17, so he's going to go, in, and this is relating to our study of the presidents, that's why we're going through this. He's going to go to Revelation 17. Now, Revelation 17, 11 has all of these symbols that tie it to this message of July 18, 2020, or the symbol of the 187 or the 18720. And so um, these are important things to understand. So Revelation 17, 11 is the one that's going to rep represent or present this uh, this study dealing with the eighth. The beast that was and is not even, he is the eighth 
and is of the seven. Now, Colin is arguing that the eighth is Trump. Now, we spent some time going back, looking at the pioneers' understanding of Revelation 12, 13, and 17, and we can see what I presented last week, uh, basically was um, Joseph Bates' view, is that the eighth refers to the image of the beast. And this would be consistent with everything we already understand, that the eighth is this resurrection, so to speak, of republicanism in the United States. So when we parallel Revelation 13 and 17, they're, they're illustrating the same thing, but differently. That is, Revelation 13 has the beast of the sea and the beast from the land. The seven-headed beast with the ten horns that have ten crowns. Right? And, and then there's going to be the two-horned beast. That's going to be the United States. And the argument of Bates is Revelation 17 is showing you this, but it's showing the woman riding this beast. And the beast is different. It's not a composite beast. Uh, it's a different beast. Uh, the woman is basically having relations with this beast, as you can tell by comparing other scriptures. And um, that the eighth is the it's another symbol for the two-horned beast of Revelation 13, which is the United States, but now in its phase when it's made an image to the beast. So it's related to the Sunday law. So the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven. And so Adilio looks at the numbers. The beast is one, the eighth is eight, and the seven is seven, one, eight, seven. But we also know that 17 times 11 is what number? July 18th. Yeah, so it's 187, right? The symbol for the midnight cry. Um, so it's 187. And we also know that the number 1117 is the 187th prime number. So 1117 is a prime number. It's the 187th prime number. So, so 11 and 17 show up in the story of Joseph, right? There's 11 years and 17 years on either side of this mirror. So there's 1711 and 1117. And uh, so that, of course, gives us the symbol of 187. Right. So, so we have all of these, these symbols that go to the story of Joseph, that go to all these different histories. There's so many connections that we could, we could spend a whole month of studies just dealing with all of these connections, dealing with 187. Um, so this 187 here, we can say that it, it is a symbol that ties us to this message. But he's going to argue based on Colin studies, that this refers to Trump. Do we have a basis for that? Has he shown us a basis other than suggesting it? Now let's look at what he says here. Trump again becoming president would of course give power to our midnight cry message. Is that true? How many people are predicting that Trump's going to be president again? Millions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of people, both within Adventism and outside of Adventism. So Trump becoming president, nobody would care about this, this few people who believe that Trump's going to become president again. I mean... Maybe if we're going around telling some personal friends Trump's going to become president again, it might have some effect on some of them. But I don't think it would be something that's going to give power to our message if Trump became president again. I don't think it would give power to, to the understanding of, of what we predicted in the past. And I've had discussions with people 
they would say big deal so if trump becomes president again i believe he's going to come become president again but i think you guys were wrong about him being the last president of the united states right so so it, it doesn't it, to me it does it doesn't really follow that this would uh, empower our message to anyone else other than that some people in this movement would be happy about it and believe that it confirmed uh, their belief. Now, he's going to just look at Revelation 17, 12, where he talks about the 10 horns and the 10 kings. He's going to add them together to get the 20. So that's 1, 8, 7, 20 by putting these two verses together. And he, he argues it's not an important uh, point, right? You, you only need Revelation 17, 11, but he just thinks it's something he wanted to add. So it's not, not a major point. Um, but he is going to uh, show that if we take this um, 1711 and 1712 and spell out the day, month, and year of the midnight cry symbol of our time, these two, two verses even seem to connect to the midnight cry of Millerite history. But because of taking the chapter and verse simply dividing the two, we get a 1.005844. Um, so he's going to take the one out there, the 58 and the four. So he's getting rid of the zeros. And then he's going to um, uh, put them together as a number. So it says it's going to equal 15844. And that's going to be the 15th day of the eighth month in 1844. And, and, and this seems like a very kind of bizarre uh, calculation. But I think it's it's still providential. I wouldn't argue against this. I wouldn't say he's stretching it here. It's something that wouldn't be a primary argument that I would show someone because it's a little bit esoteric. You know, it's kind of hidden knowledge. Esoteric means hidden knowledge. You know, people would have to kind of know a lot of things to see that this is significant. But but it is interesting. So it's going to give us the day and the month and the year of the midnight cry. 15th day of the eighth month in 1844, August 15th, 1844. Now, um, so we can see his, his, his um, evidences that he brings are correct. But the interpretation connecting it with the Trump prophecy, that's where I would have problems. And, and one of the reasons I have problems is we're gonna see as we go through these studies, um, is that we can clearly see that January 6th, 2021 is being ignored by Odilio. Probably he doesn't really know about it. Um, he doesn't understand what we experienced and, and the signs and the symbols there because it's connected to, because what happened on January 6th, 2021? That's important to us prophetically. The end of the Sixth Kingdom. Okay. Um, okay, so we have... Um, if we look at January 6th, 2021, it began what? What occurred on that date? And we know there was the siege of of Washington D.C. So so let's take a look at it here. I'm just going to switch here. Oh, it didn't work. So what you see here is a chart, and this is going to be tying from June 21st, 2020. What happens on June 21st, 2020? Uh, second warning, as it goes out to Nashville. Yeah, and that's going to be uh, 
187 days to December 25th. So 187 days is the symbol of July 18. And we tell them that Nashville is going to be hit on July 18th in the Tennessean. It uh, becomes international news, uh, really the following day, June 22nd. But uh, we have 187 days to December 25th, and we have the bombing that occurred in Nashville. So the bombing in Nashville told us that we were on the right track, that there was this connection. Now, we also have 13 days, which is 18,720 minutes to July 4th. And July 4th is a symbol of the first day of the first month that it, for the United States. And 187 days later, you're going to have January 6, 2021. And that's going to be the siege of Washington. And that's going to be 13 the end days. Of the days of prayer too. What's that? It's the end of the 100 days of prayer. Right. So July 4th is the end of 100 days of prayer. And January 6th is the beginning of 10 days of prayer. 100 days of prayer is 144,000 minutes. 13 days is 18,720 minutes. And we have 13 periods of 13 days. Now, somebody looking at this would say, well, July 4th to July 18th is actually 14 days. But the 100 days of prayer began on March 27th, 2020, including March 27th and including July 4th. So at the end of July 4th to beginning of July 18th, is 18,720 minutes. So that's a symbol, that 13 days. And it happens again, December 25th, 2020, 13 days from the bombing of Nashville to the siege of Washington. So, so the significance there, of course, is in this other chart or diagram. This one shows just more detail. Uh, so you're going to see here it doesn't have the... Uh, 187 days from Ju uh, June 21st. So, um, but it does have. When was uh, when was Nashville bombed again? When were they bombed? December 25th, 2021. Okay. Or, or, yeah, yeah. So 2020, uh, 2020. Pardon me. So December 25th, 2020. So one year to the day before the end of our 777 days. So December 25th is an important symbol. And then here you can see, this is our 777 days, right? There's the December 5th, December 25th, 2020 in the middle there, roughly, and the December 25th, 2021 that ends our 777 days. Here you have the 100 days of prayer. So March 27, which is uh, the center of this March 27, 2021 chiasm that starts in March 27, 2019, goes to March 27, 2021. March 27 is a symbol of the 27th day of the third month, which is the 273, the symbol of the Levites. And so we have 100 days of prayer, which is 144,000 minutes. And that's going to end at the end of July 4th. It's going to be completed in the 13 days. You can see the 252 days to March 27th, 2021, and the 525 days, an iteration of those numbers, ending on December 25th. And then we have uh, this 777 days divided into 252 and 525, plus it's also divided into 434 and 343. 343 is 7 times 7 times 7. And we can go from January 16th. 2021, the end of the 10 days of prayer to December 25th, 2021. So we have all of these symbols uh, that are attached here. Now, is this of God? I don't think there's any other way that you could come up with this. Right. So this is also important. And, and so we can't ignore this, just like we can't ignore what Odilio presented but we would have to connect it. Now we say, by we, the people who've been doing the morning study, we've come to the conclusion that January 6th is the end of the United States. Trump is the last president of the United States. The siege of Jerusalem in January 6th was the beginning of the globalists taking over the United States. Trump loses to Greece. 
Now, if Trump loses to Greece, we're taking Colin's study. Colin tries to argue that Trump is Greece. Right? And that is not possible. It's not possible. Greece represents uh, South. Yeah. So this is the globalist, right? So Trump is not a globalist. I thought it was I, all about Persia. Right. So he, so Colin, so let's go here. So let's go. I'm trying to bring all these different elements together. I have way too much to present today. Um, <laughs> Uh, of all the things that I want to show, but I, I want to really just get through Odilio's study and we're going to go over these things again next time. So we know when we go to Daniel chapter 11, Colin argues that the subject matter is still Persia when we get um, to verse three, and a mighty king shall stand up. So he says this is about Persia, that there's going to be this fourth, that's Xerxes, and, and Xerxes or Trump. He's going to um, stir up all against the realm of Grisha. Now, the stirring up, he doesn't stir up Grisha, because in Colin's study, some people said, oh, yeah, Grisha really got stirred up. But that's not what it says, and that's not what happens historically. He stirs up all against the realm of Grisha. But Xerxes loses to Greece. He doesn't win. And that's Esther chapter 1. And we, we, when we went through the story of Esther, we went through the, the chronology of that and show uh, how that all fits together, which was very fascinating. But then a mighty king stands up. Well, it's not the mighty king, because we know that um, when it talks about the mighty king, it's going to be referring to a king that's already been mentioned. But it says a mighty king. So this is a new king. So this king that stands up can't be Xerxes. But in Colin's interpretation, he's going to Daniel chapter 3, which is a symbol of the Sunday law as we know. That's the golden image. And he's going to argue that from chapter 2 to chapter 3 is we're going to see that this is all Babylon. And we can take this then and we can argue that this here where it's starting with Persia is kind of doing the same thing. We're going to make it all Persia. That's sort of his argument. Now, if Trump lost to the globalists, as if he lost to Greece on January 6th, he can't possibly be the king that stands up. And we know that all our line still is typical, but there is a reality that underlies it. That is, in our line, we were predicting something about Trump. And Trump has fulfilled his role in that symbolism. And now, on January 6th, we're going to see that, that the mighty king has stood up. Now, that's not Biden, because it's not about a person here. And why do I say that? Why can I, I argue that it's not about Biden, that Biden isn't, per se, um, uh, being typified by Alexander the Great? Why would I make that argument? Because we had Trump fulfilling the role of Xerxes. Why are we not looking for a president of the United States to fulfill the role here? Because remember, we, we, we took this back in 2015, I guess it began, with Trump. We started to see that Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, which was the history of these kings of Persia, because we had already started studying the kings of Persia. You know, from Darius, we then have Cyrus, and then Cambyses, and False Smyrtus, and Darius the Great, and then Xerxes, right? So that's the progression here. And we said that, that Xerxes is going to typify the next president of the United States, and we argued that that was going to be Trump. 
right? And then Trump did become the president, though we were still quite hesitant to really say that it had to be Trump. So why, are, why am I arguing that the mighty king that stands up is not Biden? That it's referring to something else? Because it's, uh, it's a world, it's a globalism, global thing now. Okay, so, so we're looking at globalism. So now we're moving from the United States. We're moving from the presidents of the United States to something else, right? We have the illustration of the, uh, of the presidents of the United States. But he's doing it to the golden image, right? Right. Yeah. So he's applying this to the golden image. The golden image is Babylon all the way through. And so he's going to argue then Daniel 11 is really Persia all the way through, which is United States all the way through. But we said Trump was the last president of the United States. Now, and, and that he was the 45th president of the United States. And you can't have it both ways. He either is or he isn't, right? Well, yeah. So, so then the United States loses to the globalists. But Biden is a puppet. Right. So Biden is not in charge. Yeah, right. He's not in charge. But it says when he shall stand up. So this is talking originally about Alexander the Great. His kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven. Right. So we can look at this as something to do with the United States. United States divided the four winds, divided the four winds of heaven. Global. Okay. You know what you're saying? Right. So that's the globalists, right? And then it says the king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes, right? So we, you, we could start looking at this history, and I, I'm not going to go through a whole study on Daniel 11 here, but we know that, um, that this kingdom is divided towards the four winds of heaven. That is, the United States is becoming globalist, right? Just like Greece. It's this world empire. It's controlled by the globalists. It's divided. How, is the United States being divided towards the four winds of heaven with with the loss with Trump's loss to the globalists daily? Yeah. Okay. Right. Division. Yeah. And so, if we were arguing that this was Biden, right? Of course, that's not the argument that Collins making, right? So he's just going to say this is Trump again, without Biden being addressed here at all um if but so this can't be biden right even even in collins interpretation but the thing is it has to be globalists now you could make the argument trump is going to become a globalist he's going to become president again and now everything that he did before he's going to he's going to act completely the opposite He's going to have a completely different set of values. Now, Trump may be not be a person uh, we would consider a person of principle, but he is according to the principles he believes in. And that is he believes in the Constitution and the rights of the individual in their pursuit of happiness. He's never, ever wavered from that belief in any of his actions. He's always been consistent. To him, this is really his God, the, the God of the United States, whatever he understands that to be. He doesn't understand Christ, Christ's meekness and loneliness or anything like that. But he is a man of principle. And to expect that Trump is going to act opposite of how he acted the first time he was president makes no sense because Trump is principled no matter what the media might portray him as. It's just he has a different set of principles than you and I. But he still believes in the right of the individual. And he never acted in any way when he was president to, against that principle. 
and he had the ability to do so, but he wouldn't. Now, there's lots of other things we have to look at. We have to look at Xerxes and, and Esther and, and other things as well to try to understand that role, because Stephen and I had a discussion about it uh, before, um, because we know that in the story of Esther, there's a type of the Sunday law there. But again, it's looking at a way mark within a bigger reform line that's illustrating something. So we know that in the story of Esther, Xerxes illustrates the Sunday law. Now, they're arguing that the pandemic is the Sunday law. And I'm not sure exactly how they think that the pandemic is going to come back again, but they, they do believe that the pandemic is never going to be over. Um, at least most of them do, most of the people who are looking at Trump bringing in the Sunday law. Um, but you can see here there's, there's a weakness in this argument. Lots of weaknesses in the argument. But they need to be addressed, because if Colin is correct, he would have to show that he's correct. He would have to bring all of the evidences together, and we should be able to study these all out and see them. Because if we're interested in understanding truth, we have to follow Miller's rules, which means you bring all of the evidence, everything to play, and you weigh it with the Holy Spirit guiding and directing you, with the character of Christ being manifested in how you treat one another. So all of those things are important in understanding truth. So we're going to go back to Adilio's study here. So I know that's not a comprehensive look at, at Collins' argument. But <clears throat> we're going to have this peace be unto you. So this peace, of course, can be rest. For the Sabbath is the seal, the sign of the mark of God. So this can be about the mark of the beast and the seal of God. And, and then he's going to uh, say, if this applies to the priest. So again, he has an if there. It once again is suggesting that a form of judgment is connected to this message, which would make sense because before the Levites can be called out, the priests will need to be sealed. Now, is this true that the priests have to be sealed before they can call out the Levites? I mean, I, I guess it depends what one means by that. Because we know we need to reflect Christ's character. But when we say sealed, what do we mean by sealed? How is he using sealed together? Okay, well, yeah, but what does he mean by sealed? I'm not sure. <laughs> this this would be sealed so that we cannot be moved, right? So, so that we're going to have our probation closed on the good side of things. And 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 there's a a partial truth to this. I mean, we do have to have Christ's character. But he's talking about sealed here as in a sense of a close of probation, that we're going to have some priests who are going to have their probations closed, and they're going to be on the wrong side of the issue. And then we're going to have another group of priests, and their probations are going to be closed as well, and they'll be on the other side. And so you're going to have some on the right side and some on the wrong side of the issue. Now, I've argued ever since I've been in this message that I don't believe we have a close of probation until Michael stands up. We can have types of close of probations. We can have close of probations for those that have rejected light. But the idea of a ceiling that means he that is righteous is righteous still is never declared until at close of probation doesn't mean that individuals aren't in that condition. But when we try to look for a close of probation that's going to be like Michael standing up, I, I think we're, we're, on, on, we're not on solid ground doing that. Let's put it that way. So we're on kind um, of thin ice. Yeah. So I would say I agree with him, though, here in the symbolism that he's using. It's just where he's placing it. Okay, so we have the closed doors, Christ standing, peace be unto you. This is typifying the judgment. 
I would agree. And we have these three verses in John 20 that say, peace be unto you. Verse 19, 21, and 26. Again, I would agree. And then the number three itself is a symbol of judgment. <coughs> John 16, verse 8, referring also to the third angel's message in the mark of the beast, which is about judgment. And when we add the chapter and verse numbers where Jesus is saying, peace be unto you, it seems to point to the third angel's message. And you can see how it adds up there. So you get 2019 plus 2021 plus 2026 equals 6066. You get rid of the zero. And you could do the zero, get rid of the zero before you do the math. But it adds up to 666. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So again, there's no way that we, you wouldn't want to argue against this because this is correct. All of those symbols are correct. It's where we're placing them. So if we're going to place this, that this movement has to accept Colin's understanding about Trump and that he has to be reelected or become president in some way, and that if you don't accept that you have closed your probation, and he's going to argue that you have to do that before, you can't wait until it happens, I would think that's a misapplication of where he's placing these symbols. Because we definitely can see that this is about a shut door, this is about a judgment, and it's going to be connected with the Sunday law. And we know that the Sunday law is a close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists, for those who reject the Sabbath. Could we argue that the rejection of the Trump prophecy is akin to rejecting the Sabbath? Would you repeat that, please? So he's saying that rejecting Trump, the Trump prophecy of Colin's understanding is a close of probation. And we know that the close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists is the Sabbath. It's a rejection of the Sabbath, right? It's the Sunday law. So could we parallel those two and say that in order to pass the Sunday law, we have to pass this test regarding Trump? Can we in any way argue for this? His yeah, argument that he's making. Connection. I don't see no connection with that. Right. I don't see the connection. Right. One is, is, is about a prophecy, understanding a prediction that someone's ma making based upon an interpretation of prophecy that we have disagreement about. But now he's going to argue, since he can use all these symbols, which I agree with the symbols, I just don't agree that we can connect them to the Trump prophecy. That if we're going to connect it, we're going to connect it to the Sunday law, are we not? Right. Right. Because all of the symbols are pointing to the Sunday law. They're not pointing to the Trump prophecy. He's actually given us nothing to point us to the Trump prophecy. Other than a suggestion that this might be, this possibly could be, if, and then this would be a close of probation. But I don't see, I don't see his arguments for this as very sound. He doesn't really present arguments for it. He just, it's just a suggestion. But I definitely can't argue with all of the symbols that he's presented here. But we would have to place those with the Sunday law, not with the Trump prophecy. A any thoughts on that? Now he's going to talk about these verses being uh, switched a little bit. He marks them out. Um, so you got this different order. And so then he's going to take this 19 and 26 and he's going to use it as a way that we can switch these numbers around. And so that we can get that 1629 number. Right? So 1629, this, this number that he got from his other... And I, I would agree with him here. I have no problem with this. This is actually a pretty powerful symbol. So this 1629 came from his study uh, dealing with the pandemic. And we could see that um, 1989 is 1629 plus 360. Um, you take this symbol July 18th and you subtract it. Um, 
from 1629. So that's, um, what was he doing here? I can't remember how he does it. Can somebody explain what he does here with this one? Uh, just. Um, it's to the 9-11. Oh, right. Nine, it gives you 9-11. There it is. It's just I would have reversed these numbers the other way around. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so 911 plus 718 is 1629. And then also 391 um, plus 1629 gives us, what does that give us? July 18, 2020, that gives us 18720, right? Is that right? No, that's not right. What is he doing here? Three. 1820. The 2020. 2020, yeah. Yeah, so it gives us the 2020. Yeah, that's what it gives us. And then um, now Leviticus, he uses Leviticus 1629. Remember, we also have Exodus 1629 and uh, Numbers 1629. He uses Numbers 1629 as well. But when we put them all together, uh, we actually get a different picture. So he's trying to tie this to the pandemic, which I don't think is solid. The other thing that we can do is, um, uh, I'm just going to go here. I'm just going to show you my calculator so it's a little easier to see. And this number 1629 minus 1260 is this number 369. So what's 369? The third, sixth, and ninth hour. Third, sixth, and ninth hour. Yeah. Now, I've also noted that if you take this number and you add it to 963, you get 1332, which divided by 2 is 666. So, so this number 369 is related to 666. And I would argue that here um, there's lots of things that we could do regarding uh, his chart there. Um, but I wouldn't ignore the fact that we're going to mark the Sunday law here and that I can produce the Sunday law with this symbolism, right? Attracting 1260. So, and there's other things you could do with 1629 as well. Um, but he's going to focus on this Leviticus uh, 1629. Um, and we also the, know the Hebrew number 1629 from the Strong's Dictionary means to be cut off. And he's going to focus on this 1629 about the Day of Atonement. And then he's also going to deal with numbers 1629. But we won't look at that now. So this is important. What he says here, I think, is, is what we need to pay attention to. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whoso, whosoever, sin, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. The Holy Spirit was not yet fully manifested. Christ had not yet been glorified. The more abundant impartation of the Spirit, of Spirit did not take place till after Christ's ascension. Not until this was received could the disciples fulfill the commission to preach the gospel to the world, but the Spirit was now given for a special purpose. Before the disciples could fulfill their official duties in connection with the church, Christ breathed his Spirit upon them. He was committing to them a most sacred trust, and he desired to impress them with the fact that without the Holy Spirit, this work could not be accomplished. The Holy Spirit is the breath of spiritual life in the soul. The impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. It imbues the receiver with the attributes of Christ. Only those who are thus taught of God, those who possess the inward working of the Spirit, and in whose life the Christ life is manifested, are to stand as representative men to minister in behalf of the church. So when we look at this, we can see that God wants to breathe his spirit upon us. 
And he has been, in a sense, doing that by giving us light. But there's a work that needs to be done in our lives. And that it has to be in, in accordance with the character of Christ. So he says here, in measure, the Holy Spirit was endowed upon all that were present in the room who saw and accepted the evidence Jesus showed them. This then would apply to those who have seen and accepted the evidence brought forward in these presentations. It would apply to all those are in the same, that are in the same room, on the same level, who are of one accord and of one heart and mind in order to carry the work forward for the advancement of his kingdom. So the argument is here is that we have to accept the evidence that's been brought in these two studies, the Nero study and uh, the COVID pandemic in July 18 study, and now really this study. Is that really what is being said in this spirit of prophecy statement? Can we make the argument from how he has set these studies and the symbols that are connected with the studies that, that he presented, that these, in a sense, are the test? I'm having trouble seeing that. Yeah. Yeah, I would have trouble seeing that, right? One is because God has been leading this movement. And he has shown us many, many things that have just as much evidence, if not more evidence, that God is leading in our studies of those who don't agree with this view. Now, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somehow we're self-deceived. Who knows? But for us to know this, we would have to study all of the evidence. We've had some very, very powerful studies uh, in the morning that have given us all these illustrations such as the 1335 that we went over last week the 1335 years and the 666 years and again the 1335 and so all of this light that's connected to our understanding of of millerite's history of uh, miller's understanding of the prophecies of samuel snows and this movement and jeff's all of these things have to be in agreement. And so I don't see that his argument follows from all of the evidence that we have, that he's just misplacing it. He, he's, he's arguing that this, this is occurring with these studies. I would say that we have to look at these studies. Yeah. So he's just applying it to his studies and nothing else. Right, right, yeah. So, so I would say that it's not. I mean, I wouldn't do that. I personally wouldn't say my studies are the test. You have to accept my studies. Um, even though we we have lots of evidence, these studies are of God, and we can see that these studies here have that same, the same evidences, the same symbols are being used, but there's a misapplication being made. And so I would hope that Adilio recognizes that in time. I don't think it's a test right now in the sense that, you know, that if he doesn't accept that, I, that he's wrong in how he's making the application, that he's closed his probation. I think right now we're just studying. He's making a suggestion based on, on the evidences that he's seen. And the mistake that he would make is if he doesn't take the time to examine all of the evidences and just assumes that because he has these symbols attached to his dates, that means that his conclusions are correct in his studies, right? Because he's going to argue that 9-11's a inside job. That's his study on Nero. And then he's going to argue that uh, there's all these conspiracy theories with the pandemic, he's going to argue with these, uh, that those are correct. And I would argue that they're not correct. That he's correct in his use of the symbols, but not in his application of them, where he's placing them. But that's something you have to decide for yourself. Right? Everybody's going to have to decide that. 
I can't decide it for you. <clears throat> now, here it says, when Jesus first met the disciples in the upper chamber, Thomas was not with them. He heard the reports of the others and received abundant proof that Jesus had risen, risen but gloom and unbelief filled his heart. Disciples tell of the wonderful manifestations of the risen Savior. It only plunged, plunged him in deeper despair. If Jesus had really risen from the dead, there could be no further hope of a literal earthly kingdom. And it wounded his vanity to think that his master should reveal himself to all the disciples except him. He was determined not to believe, and for a whole week he brooded over his wretchedness, which seemed all the darker in contrast with the hope and faith of his brethren. Um, Desire of Ages 806, paragraph 4. Thomas here is in type representing those who reject truth, despite sufficient evidence being provided as, the, as to the validity in our application of the messages concerning July 18 and the Trump prophecy. Now, Thomas, of course, is not lost. So who would Thomas represent if we're going to make an application of this passage in the spirit of prophecy and in the Bible. Who does who does Thomas represent? Those that have heard the message but have not really taken it to heart. Okay. Now we know that his name is a doubling, right? Thomas means a twin and Didymus means uh, a doubling, right? So wouldn't he be represent those who receive the midnight cry? We, we couldn't mark him as somebody who's lost or who's shut out, who's on the wrong side of the door, could we? Thomas and Levites or something? Or, uh... Well, yeah, so like the Levites. He's re but one thing we can't do with Thomas is make him someone that's lost. So Thomas isn't representing a class that's lost because they rejected light. These are people that are going to receive light. Right? They're going to receive light and they're going to accept it. Even but, though they did, did have sufficient proof otherwise. Yeah, Dwight? But just in, in this situation, just like you just said, as you were reading this, here is Thomas. Thomas still believed at that point that this was going to be a literal fulfillment of a figurative prophecy. And that right? would be, and that would represent people who are trying to push that somehow Trump Thank you. Be president again. Thank right? you. Right. Exactly. So yeah. So it would actually be the class that's being represented by Thomas would be those that are accepting the Trump prophecy. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That would seem that would seem logical. Why? Yeah. Yeah. That's the only only person he that could receive it. Now, the hope here then, my hope is that people who are on the side of the Trump prophecy and caught up in trying to vindicate themselves, they're, they're discouraged because of July 18th. And now they're trying to find some way to revive it. That they haven't closed their probation. That they are going to have to come together 
at some point. Because the one thing that we don't want to do is to just dismiss others who disagree with us and call them heretics just because of a difference of belief regarding pretty minor things in some ways, if you want to call it that way. It can be major if people continue to act in an unchristlike manner towards their brethren, right? That is, if we see the group acting like FFA did on December 6th, 2020, when they wrote that declaration and cut off everyone, started taking down videos, right? If we're acting that way towards people that we disagree with, we would have to admit we're on the wrong side of the issue. If we're involved in censoring people that we disagree with, that we haven't taken the time to understand their position, we are in the wrong. Would we agree with that? Yes. The, yes. Point, the, the rest of the point is also very simple. Yeah. Because those that they're disagreeing with are presenting what they are seeing from Scripture. Mm -hmm. Now, are we told at any point that we are to reject what Scripture says? Are we to set aside Scripture in any manner? No. Are we not supposed to compare line upon line, precept upon precept, and if someone says something in a study in that manner, and we don't agree with it, are we not instructed that we are then to investigate his position? Right. Yeah. So the statement that we have um, in the spirit of prophecy, which we were happy to use when people rejected the 2520, right? So we would use this scripture. <clears throat> uh, and I'm going to add the part of partial paragraph before that. Cling close to your Bible, for its sacred truths can purify ennoble and sanctify the soul you must hold the truth and teach it as it is in jesus else it is of no value to you before the light of god's truth let human opinions and ideas and human wisdom appear as they are in the sight of god as foolishness if a brother differ with you on some points of truth do not stoop to ridicule do not place him in a false light or misconstrue his words making sport of them do not misinterpret his words and rest them of their true meaning. This is not conscientious argument. Do not present him before others as an heretic. When you have not with him investigated his positions, taking the scriptures text by text in the spirit of Christ to show him what is truth. You do not yourself really know the evidence he has for his faith, and you cannot really clearly define your own position. Take your Bible and in a kindly spirit weigh every argument that he presents and show him by the scriptures if he is in error. When you do this without unkind feelings, you will do only that which is your duty and the duty of every minister of Jesus Christ. Letter 21, 1888. Um, so we know that we have a responsibility here. And, and I always find that we learn so much when we do, when we follow this counsel, that is, we can be corrected. In some ways, how we came up to our understanding of the 666 years and how we came to our understanding of the beasts of Revelation 12, 13, and 17 was listening to the arguments of Miller and the others, right? We took the time to examine these arguments and that's what we have to do. We take time. I, no way would I ever try to misrepresent what Colin is saying. Call him a heretic or a dilio. It's not, that's not my place. What I want to do is look at the arguments they make and see if they're sound. And we can see that much of what Odilio is presenting is sound. Much of what Colin presents is sound. But the question is, 
are they going to do the same with what we are presenting, with, with what God is showing us? And are we going to together look at these things? Are we going to have an upper room experience? And my belief is that we have to. That Thomas has to come in to the room with the other disciples. And he has to look at the evidence. And when he does so, his doubts will be removed. Now, in a sense, we can say all of us are Thomas. So not trying to just label somebody else as Thomas. But all of us need to, to have that experience because we all have doubts. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to have evidence. And we could argue that all the evidence was there. We, as human beings, are faulty. And so if we don't take the time to examine the evidence, that's where we'll be on the wrong side of the door. And I'm not arguing that, that, that he's right in his application of that this closed door is now, because I don't believe that that's what's being said. Um, but I do believe that um, we can make an application, just as we are here, in this sort of very secondary sense or tertiary sense, because it's always true in any situation that we need to follow this counsel that Ellen White gives us. And when we, we talk about people and we misrepresent them, we present them as a heretic because they don't agree with us, we're going to be on the wrong side of the door. And that door closes. And we can't afford to do that. And we can't afford to do that because of others as well. When we act in this way, we do damage to the kingdom of God. We're a stumbling block. Yeah, we become a stumbling block to others. And so we have to be very, very careful how we talk about others and the attitude that we have about others who differ with us. Because this, this is not a major difference when, we, when we're talking about this, at least from my perspective. This is something where we're studying to try to understand the truth. And if we truly want to understand the truth, we're going to weigh every argument. And we may be in error, but if someone's in error, and, and I've made this argument um, to pastors and to others, if you believe that I'm in error, shouldn't you follow the, the counsel that's given here in the spirit of prophecy? And I've had a pastor say, he can't do it. He can't take every time that somebody has some view, he can't take the time as a pastor to actually look into what that person's teaching. And I, and I told him, this was in a Sabbath school class, it was my pastor at the time, it's a different pastor than we have now. But I told him, well, if you can't take the time to do that, you shouldn't be a pastor because that's the work of the pastor. Sure, you're not gonna look at everything out there, but if it affects a church member, it affects your church. And if you just shut people down, without hearing them, without following this counsel, you actually do damage to the church. And we do damage to the movement if we don't follow this counsel. So we have to do it. Any final thoughts? I went longer than I wanted to. Well, it's important to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. Um, we're going to close with prayer now. And, uh, uh, and then we'll talk about what's happening tomorrow. Okay, so let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath hours. Please be with us throughout the Sabbath. Please teach and direct us. We pray for your healing in our lives. Um, we know, Lord, that... Um, you put these challenges before us uh, to teach us, help us to learn 
the lessons that you would have us learn. We pray for this movement. We pray for all those who have been following this message. And we just ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can use us and encourage us that we can come together in the spirit of Christ to accept your truth and to understand it. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>